Hello and welcome to another Q&A show here on Watch It Play. My name is Matthew and together with a lot of your help, we're going to try and answer all of the internet's burning board game questions. The first question we have this month is how would you fix the Board Game Geek Top 100? Well firstly you'd have to accept the idea that it's broken. I wouldn't say it's broken. Fix is a bit strong. How would I change it? And now I can think of lots of ways that I would change it, which we will go into now. As a caveat here I'll say I use Board Game Geek probably more than most people. I use it every single day for my hobby, time, fun time, you know, being a board gamer, which sometimes I forget that I am. And for my work time, I use it every day for work. I rely on Board Game Geek. You know, I love it. And I'm so thankful and happy that it's there as the, an amazing trove and archive of everything board games. By Fix the Top 100, I think what they're talking about is the fact that it is a fact that the more complex a game is, the higher it ranks averagely rather than lighter games which rank low. Now that's not to say that the best game of all time on Board Game Geek is the most complicated game ever, it's just that when judging games the complexity of that game or the perceived complexity of that game has a factor in it which means that the top 100 is frankly full of heavier games. Games that people love, games that people play but certainly heavier games on average. The thing that I would do to change the Board Game Geek Top 100 is you can go to Board Game Geek and you can filter the Top 100 by the amount of votes a game has got. Rather than the average ranking of that game, which is how they end up where they are, you can filter by the amount of times that game has been voted for at all. And when you look at that list, we go away from the hobby, heavy, often Euro kind of board games and you see a list of 100 games that are games for everyone. You know, I'm not here to make a judgment call on the quality of the games in the top 100 or any game uh, or your opinion on them. I'm happy people have opinions on games. That's how this whole industry survives. But we go away from having Brass, Pandemic Legacy, Gloomhaven, Ark Nova, Twilight Imperium, Dune Imperium, uh, Terraforming Mars, those games, which I think are, admittedly, heavier games, to having Catan at number one, Carcassonne, Regular Pandemic, Seven Wonders, Terraforming Mars, still right here, <laughs> Seven Wonders Duel, Dominion, Codename, Ticket to Ride, Wingspan, Azul, those games, I think, show the hobby more as it really is more as these are the games that people are playing. You know, oftentimes people say, well, you know, when you start out in the board games, don't go to the top 100 and just buy the top 10 games. You won't, you won't play them. And I've had that experience because I've had games when I started out, I got things like Concordia and I hated it. And it was just too much for me at the time. Now I love Concordia. I think it's a fantastic game. But if you could just go to start the hobby, it's rare that that many people are gonna just dive straight into the heavier games. Not impossible, I'm sure lots of people watch have done that but people who dive into board games who you want to get into the hobby start with Catan and Carcassonne, Pandemic, Seven Wonders and I think that is what I believe should be the true ranking of the games on Board Game Geek. That's a better representation of board games as a hobby, it's a better representation of what people are playing and I think truly these are the greatest games ever made. I really do. The other thing I would do to change the regular top 100 board games of all time and the way that uh, games rank on Board Game Geek is I would make it so that rankings expire. After three years, let's say, your ranking comes up, you get a notification, your ranking for so-and-so game is about to disappear, what would you rank it now? That, I think, would have a vast change on the landscape of what games are the top games. I think that would be really interesting because that would take away the hotness feeling, the it's new feeling, the it was a Kickstarter that I paid a lot of money for feeling. That would be, okay, in hindsight, yeah, I think that game probably is more of a seven than an eight to me. And because these rankings never go away, 
it means the list is at times a bit sterile. We want them to be more of a representation of the world. And I think having your ranking disappear every three years would be a great way to come back and reevaluate because people don't. That's why things stay pretty, you know, pretty stagnant sometimes. Because our opinions change, our tastes change, our excitement changes. And after three years you go, how do I feel about this now? I think that would be a great change. How would you change the Board Game Geek Top 100? Not by saying I would put this game at number one. That's not what I mean. Board Game Geek is, to me, probably, personally, the most important website on the internet. I am thankful for Board Game Geek every single day. So I don't want anyone to think any otherwise. But those are the changes I would make. But for something that I wish never changes, it's the fact that we've got a sponsor for this week's episode, who, in part, made it possible. Let me be the first to introduce you to Hispania from Draco Ideas, because at the beginning of the 2nd century BC, the Republic of Rome sought to expand into the Mediterranean coast of Hispania. Simple, you might think, but oh no, because its citizens turned out to be a formidable enemy, trapping Rome in a fierce war that devoured praetors, consuls, and legions for almost 200 years. And this sets the stage for Hispania, the Roman Conquest, a cooperative game in which one to three Roman consuls attempt to subdue the peoples of the Hispania Peninsula. And if you're looking for even more of a challenge, well, Hispania delivers because this has several modular expansions, historical scenarios, and a competitive mode that allows an additional player to lead the Hispanic resistance against Rome. Follow the link in this video's description to find Hispania's GameFound campaign, which is running right now. Will your leadership be what finally delivers Hispania into Roman hands? Well, follow the link and Let's find out. This next question is, what does the best board game of all time look like to you? The answer to this is so incredibly subjective, right? What does it mean to me personally, the best game of all time? So I, I, I was thinking about this and I, I wrote down the things I like most in games most often is tile placement, set collection, a little bit of push your luck, and something I call a, a go big or go home strategy. Is something I love in games, but I also love trick taking. I probably don't want all those things in the same game, honestly, but those are the things that I love. And the question is, would it be something that I already love, the best game of all time? I mean, if your favorite game of all time is Dominion and someone asked you 20 years ago, what does the best game of all time look like? And deck building didn't exist. So they couldn't answer would deck building in it, even though deck building would become, you see what I mean? Who knows? Maybe the best game of all time hasn't been designed yet, and I can't even fathom it. That's exciting. I know that one thing I look for in games, and I'm a really big fan of, are games that are simple to learn, but have a depth of strategy and tactics within them. Things that have a simple rule set and simple turns, but what happens on those turns has big ramifications. You know, that's why I've always been drawn to Knizia games and Stefan Feld games, because I love it when on your turn, you can do one of these three things, but that means something. Or one thing I also love in games is you've got this thing. You can use it for this, for this, or for this, but the choice is yours. So is the misery of the failed decision made wrong. You lose. <laughs> I love that. Multi-use cards do that, but that decision every turn, that's really what I'm looking for. I'm looking to play a game rather than have the game play out. I know personally for me, I like when there's interaction in a board game. I don't need it, but I do like it. I mean, trick-taking games are intrinsically uh, interactive games. I'm playing this card. What card are you going to play because of that? But I don't like games that destroy things I've built. You know, I don't mind a space being taken on a worker placement board, but once I've taken that space, I don't want you to... Then the sniper kills my worker. No, thank you. Or I build a building, taking me six turns, and you destroy that. No, I, I, don't, I don't personally love that. But again, some people do. I think I'd describe some type of game that has secret end game scoring or where you don't know who the winner is the whole something i really get frustrated with sometimes in games is when you go 
Well, I've still got 25 minutes to play of this game, and I already, I know I've lost. So I'm just here for you to, can I concede? <laughs> no one wants that. I like it when games are down to the final push. That's something that I really appreciate in games. So I think secret scoring or end game bonuses, those type of things, I like it when those are in games a lot. And let's be honest, I like games about farming, I like games about ancient Rome and ancient Greece, and I like games set in Japan. Very personal, subjective opinions. I'm pretty lucky, honestly, with the themes that I like, because that's a lot of the games that we uh, have. <laughs> I also think variable setup is important, a game that won't play out. The, the, you know, the opening gambit isn't going to be the same every time. You know, the tiles that are out to pick from, or the powers that you have in your hand, the cards, the abilities, what you've drawn, all those things. So it's like, it's different every time. So it gives a game lots of replayability. Those are the things that would compile my favorite game of all time. And I just know that those games are out there. And a lot of the games that I absolutely love do all that. There's probably some games on the show. I mean, White Castle. Was I describing White Castle this whole time? Maybe. You know, uh, Castles of Burgundy, which is my favourite game of all time. I want Castles of Burgundy the trick-taking game. Final answer. What's your favourite thing? What would make your perfect game? Let me know. And the final question this month is, did anyone have any good thrift store finds recently? I've always been obsessed with thrift stores and charity shops as we call them, and I've covered them on this show in the past, but it's been a, a good year and a half maybe since we spoke about them last. Uh, has anyone found anything good? I want you to put down in the comments, if you can, your best thrift store finds, because I have one that I was really happy about. It happened in December. I remember distinctly, it was a great day. I tell you, I, here's the story. I walked into the charity shop. It was a scope. If you were living in Britain, that's the charity shop it was. You can go to Oxfam, but I tell you, they, they know what they're doing price-wise with board games. I saw something the other day in, in Oxfam, and it was the same price it would have been new. But I went into this shop just because I do. I do think you need to check thrift stores twice a week. I do a twice weekly thrift store run in a town near me called Stourbridge. And if you're doing that in Stourbridge, leave the games for me. <laughs> so I went in and I saw on the shelf, uh, Catan, the Rivals of Catan, the little card game, which is the game I already own. I was like, oh cool, there's a, there's a game here. And then I saw a copy of Carcassonne. I was like, oh, a game I already own. I don't need to buy another copy. I'm not gonna buy up copies of things in thrift stores just because they're a good buy. I'm gonna leave them for other people to play. But then I saw it, I honed in, because on the shelf was a copy of Ticket to Ride, which again I own, but it was Ticket to Ride Nordic Countries, which is a game that I sold years ago and have regretted ever since. I was like, Ticket to Ride Nordic Countries? I opened the box, everything was there, just a little quick shufty count of the cards. Three player tokens, perfect. The board is uh, not wet or something, great. I looked at the, the price, £2.50. This is the best day of all time. This is the best day of this of my life, which says a lot. But it was just great. And I went to the counter. I felt like I was stealing. I wasn't. I was going to pay £2.50 for this game. And I bought a 50 pence raffle ticket at the kindness of my heart, which I didn't win. So there's that. So Ticket to Ride Nordic Countries, I tell you, the energy, the adrenaline, that course is through my body when I find something good in a thrift store or a charity shop. It's, oh, it's unparalleled. It's like a drug. I love it. What have you found recently? Let me know. Let's all get jealous of everybody's thrifts. I saw someone the other day who found a copy of Discworld Ankh-Mork Pork. They put it on a Facebook group. They bought it for five pounds. Who is this person? Why do they? Why? Why do bad things happen to me? Which is how I consider when good things happen to other people. Did you find all of Battlestar Galactica and three expansions? Don't tell me about that. I don't need to know. <laughs> Let us know anything you've got in thrift stores below. That's it for another month of questions and answers here on What You Played. I'd love to see all your answers. Thanks so much for being here. And until next month, thanks for watching everyone.